Welcome to another edition of Senior Moments with a Question Mark. Lee, why is there a question mark? That's a good question, Bob. I really do not have an answer to that. Well, it's because we do not have senior moments. We have intellectual pauses. Okay, I'll buy that. And having just had a birthday, um, I like that. Anyway, happy <laughs> holidays to everybody. Whether it's Kwanzaa, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever, happy holidays. As you can tell, I'm starting to get into the spirit. Okay. Today, Question. Who had a birthday? Huh? Whose birthday was it? Mine. Oh. Compliano no, A2. I haven't, Compliano I haven't, A2. I haven't introduced you yet. Let me introduce you. This mystery man over here, I'm going to introduce him now. Okay, as you know, um, we have a, a lot of people behind the scenes in Beverly. Um, they're walking around, and you don't know whether they're famous or they're not. Well, there's a lot of people that have done an awful lot of things in their life, and my guest is one of them. Uh, in fact, he was on the board of BevCam. He's a fellow Rotarian with me, and his name is Lee Yaffa. Yaffa. Does Yaffa mean Yaffa, 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 talk, 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 talk? No. no what, does, what does it mean? Uh, I what? think in Hebrew it actually means uh, beautiful. Whoa. We are with a beautiful gentleman uh, uh, th th this afternoon. Anyway. The more recent thing that he's done behind the scenes, he is the editor of former Mayor Scanlon's book that we just have learned so much about Scanlon's uh, life in office. All right, so we're going to learn about Lee's life. Lee, where were you born? Where did you come from? Where are you going? Okay. Uh well, uh, let's see. I was born in 1947, actually in Brookline, Mass. Right. The birth was scheduled for Boston, but the hospital okay, we, we don't, at that time. We don't need, if we get into too many details, we're not going to finish. So you were, the answer is, I was born in Brookline. And then that I moved correct. to Dorchester. Well, that's where my parents lived. I was born, legend has it, I was born about the same time that the um, UFOs were sighted over Roswell, New Mexico, 1947. Okay. So that may have set a pace for me. In, uh, I went to grade school in Dorchester, uh, Sarah Greenwood School, I think it's still there. And in the third grade, uh, I was hit by a car. Oh, that the... guys, that explains it. <laughs> okay, sorry. Left side of my head, the question was, did the car really hit me? Or was it my lunchbox that got hit by the car and then sprung up and hit me by the head? But to continue on uh, from there, I went to the Oliver Wendell Holmes Junior High School. Mm, good one. And I remember one episode quite vividly that really set a tone for me. Um, eighth grade math class, uh, late Friday afternoon, uh, Mr. McLaughlin, Scottish guy, short but tough knuckles. He gave a math assignment. And then that was for the weekend. And then Paula Berman went... Oh, no. So McLaughlin raised his fist and said, okay, I'm going to double the assignment. 
And then Dummy Yaffa gets up and says, I don't think you should punish the whole class for the actions of uh -oh. one student. Uh -oh. You didn't do that back then. Knuckles went up, Yaffa, detention, start Monday. So I showed up for detention, and the assignment was in detention for me to memorize word by word the poem Robert Frost had intended to speak at JFK's inauguration as president. And six years later? No, uh, six and a half months later, six and a half months later, yeah. I got out of detention because I didn't memorize it. Uh, to segue back a minute, Robert Frost had written a great poem uh, that started summoning artists to participate in the august occasions of the state is something for us to celebrate. Do you uh, think that, that got you interested in literature and in uh, eventually communications? Well, maybe somewhat, but uh, yeah, I was already reading The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. <laughs> so, uh, Frost had written that speech just two weeks before the inauguration, but it was such a cold, wintry day, and the sun so bright, Frost could not really see his words on paper. So instead, at the inauguration day, he recited another poem from memory. But when I showed up, I got the much longer poem. I think there's about... 90 or okay. so phrase lines. This is about But it taught me perseverance. Got you. But this is not about Robert Frost's life. It's about your life. So we have to move on. Well, that was an important factor in my life. Perseverance. Okay. Okay. Uh, I went to Boston Technical High School and then uh, Boston University. Uh, which offered me a scholarship. Oh. And uh, they were the only college at that time that, to actually send me a brochure about the university. You're kidding. No, you could take an SAT test and request your scores be sent to three schools. So I t took their letter and brochure as a matter of appreciation, and I'm thumbing through it, and mm -hmm. nothing really really hit me mm -hmm. until I got to the very end of the book and our catalog if you will I see this school with a radio tower and I said wow I go to my parents I say hey I can get a degree and become a disc jockey at the same time All right, so that was your interest well the school interested me yeah uh, but you were interested in possibly being a disc jockey for your life. Well, work. <laughs> it was hep on it, but uh, once I started, I really uh, zeroed in on print media journalism. Uh -huh. You know, newspapers are very strong. Okay. I did take classes in broadcasting and film. I did receive a small scholarship from BU, but I really needed to. I earned some money while at school to really carry forward. At that time, the university newspaper was subsidized by BU as a university department, even though it was a student newspaper. So I started selling ads, mm -hmm. second year uh, circulation manager, and uh, third year, I guess, assistant business manager, wow. and fourth year, de facto business manager publisher. Okay, on the editorial side, uh, the paper was liberal my first year, but gradually became more involved in uh, overseas events, uh, the way the campus was being managed and overseen, and tilted to the radical side. And by the end of my third year, uh, the editors were clamoring for the newspaper to become truly independent. And by that time, I sense the trustees were kind of fed up with everything. There was a lot of uh, 
dissension and uh, marches everybody's, for causes. Everybody's trying to gain control. Well, this is the 60s, late 60s. Yeah, right. The trustees, I think, said, okay, that's it. We're going to give you $50,000 to go independent. So I spent most of my um, summer between junior and senior year arranging business affairs for what now would be the news, no longer the BU news. And uh, they actually asked <laughs> if they should write the check to me personally. <laughs> But uh, we had incorporated by that time, and um, we started out okay, and I saw, I was pretty optimistic from a publishing or business standpoint for the paper. As a university paper, you were considered a department and had a budget, and you could run only a 16-page or 24-page paper each week. Now that we were independent, I thought we could accept much more advertising. And at that time, Reader's Digest oversaw all, a lot of national advertising and would send in the uh, repro sheets to be reproduced. Well, midway through the senior year, the editors uh, decided to run a uh, thinly disguised nude photo on the front page. Uh -oh. They'd go on tabloid. And I should digress. The paper met the ideal uh, for a newspaper. Business never told the editors what to write or, or produce, and they never interfered with the way the business side was run. But the new uh, paper, the tear sheets, must have reached Reader's Digest. So, a week later, I get a call. <laughs> Mr. Yaffa, this is Reader's Digest. Would you please explain to us what the hell is going on with your newspaper? Right. So, you know, I gave it a soft approach to them, but gradually the uh, anticipation for more national advertising dissipated. Mm. And... Uh, it was interesting. So that was good on your resume, though. Uh, well, I just, refer I there. just referenced that I ran the newspaper. All right, so you're looking for a job, and... Uh, After I graduated? Yeah. yeah. I uh, did a stint in Vermont, and I kept caught with the weekly, but then I needed some money. I took on the job as a managing editor of a business publication in New York City, and it intrigued me because the publishing company was moving to Pittsfield, the Berkshires, and that appealed to me. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting uh, stint. It was an international engineering construction magazine, and I had field editors, and I would review the copy, assemble magazine, do the entire layout, uh, et cetera. Uh, when it was still in New York City, I met with a lot of people at the United Nations who had developing projects that could be featured somewhat mm -hmm. or reported on the magazine. It was an interesting go, and it was only circulated internationally, uh, not globally, i.e., no U.S. circulation. Mm -hmm. It was printed in uh, Holland because at that time they had the lowest postage rates of any country uh -huh. in the world. So less expensive, have it printed and mailed at the time to everybody. Uh, I stayed with that for a couple of years, then I traveled to Boston. They took a position with a fuel trades association that had a magazine, and they represented about 5,000 independent heating oil companies in New England at that time. Mm -hmm. This is the early 70s. Today, I'm not even sure you have 500 left due to all the mergers and what has really happened to the industry and the transformation uh, and, and um, price escalation. Like a buddy of yours, Kevin Kelleher, Kelleher 
had his company. Okay, he sold it to Scott. Correct. And Mr. Scott, by the way, just passed away a couple of days ago. I understand that. Side, I, sidebar. Yes, I know. I know this Scott's, well, I know this Scott family very well. Well, it was an interesting time. Well, isn't, I it, Kevin, there. isn't it Kevin that got you into Rotary? Uh, <laughs> Kevin and I knew each other before I started Rotary. And Kevin said, why don't you show up at Rotary? So I showed up, but there was no Kevin. I showed up at Rotary <laughs> for about three months on my own, and uh, Kevin still owes me a, a Rotary luncheon <laughs> on, on his wallet. But uh, finally someone came over and said, who the hell are you? Well, we noticed you've been here for a few months. Now this was back uh, in... In 94. 94. But let me go back to the heating oil industry because that really set a pace for me going forward. I worked for them for two years, decided I needed a break again, and I took a job as a book designer with Allen & Bacon Publishing. Uh, eventually, they were acquired by Simon Schuster. So I was with them for about a year. I did some interesting titles. Big in schools. Well, yeah, some of their titles were. They competed with Houghton Mifflin, but... Uh, and Ad Addison, that was right up on yeah. 128? Well, Addison, I think, was more into math textbooks and science. Uh, in a college, yeah. In yeah, fact, well, Alan Began had a college division, too. In fact, I used too. one of their uh, uh, textbooks when I was uh, uh, teaching out at Illinois State. Oh, okay. I, I know of Addison Wesley. But it was interesting. Um, I worked in the elementary high school, L High, design department. And uh, <laughs> it was kind of a flaky year because... Alan Bacon ran the, the division like you were at a grade school. Nine to five. Everybody went out to lunch, noon to one, including the switchboard operator. <laughs> and uh, I met my future wife there. She was a, an editor, and we collaborated on a, an infamous title, Introduction to Mechanical Drawing. Well, I heard you nine. collaborated on a lot of things. Okay. Well, we're walking out for lunch one time, and the phone rings in the uh, librarian's office. And I remember she picked up the phone and answered and left a note. And this is why some companies never really uh, were able to continue because of their modus operandi, if you will. On the way back, the librarian calls her over and says, says uh, Miss Armeo, her maiden name at the time, mustn't, mustn't. <laughs> Why would you not answer the phone for someone else? Again, this early 70s, Ma Bell ruled the roost because it could be a long distance call and you'd be obligated to return it, i.e. costing the company some money. Forget about the fact it could have been for book orders. It could have been the President of the United States. Well, who knows? <laughs> you went in there and never had someone. Right. I finally gave it up there when <clears throat> uh, they always like to save within. When they, when they said you had to get permission from the design director to make Xerox copies which was crazy because here I was doing a math book and sending the galleys out to England, and you definitely would want to have copies of your work if a question came up. Sure. Okay, about the same time things were happening in the oil industry, uh, the world's largest oil port for tankers at the time was Rotterdam, and the second largest was in Portland, Maine. And that's because at the time, uh, they would show up and there'd be two pipelines running from Portland north up into Montreal and other parts of Canada because the tankers could not get past the ice flow 
in the St. Lawrence Seaway. So uh, I got a call from that trade association I had worked for, and they asked me to come back. And why? Because they were getting word out of the Portland area and uh, overseas newspapers of forthcoming turmoil with oil. And that was right because uh, I started again with them and oil rose from like 10 cents a gallon. This is heating oil. 10 cents to 15 cents. Well, that's a big jump back then. Right. Then to 25 cents. And then uh, during that second stint, the Arabs imposed their embargo. Things were crazy. Nixon imposed price controls. And for the heating oil industry, that was devastating to a point. I.e., if you sold your oil at 30 cents right. at this point, date in January, as of midnight, you were locked in to 30 cents until price controls were waved off. Then where did you go? Well, no, I stayed with that for a while. Uh -oh. I was a liaison for that group with uh, um, down in Congress uh, because there were hearings about the price controls and the industry imposed mandatory allocations, i.e., if you were a company like Kelleher Oil, you were told by a major supplier like Mobile right. that you could only have 70% of the product supply you had last year. So people had to cut back everywhere. Uh, I had a disagreement with the executive director. He was a brilliant guy, but very difficult to work with. And, yeah, I didn't go out in the street, but I kind of bounced around on my own for a little while. But people who knew me from working in the field, knew my communications background, right. started to contact me and say, we've got a project. Would you like to work on it? So when did you move your uh, business to Beverly? Around 90? Well, I freelanced for a number of years. No, we had a property in Lynn with the studio. Uh, we moved to Beverly in 1984. 19, oh. oh, I'm sorry. 94. 94. 94. And uh, it, I had a studio on the property. Uh, we were in the Cove area. And then we were still you know, growing somewhat. We took space on Washington Street. And I wanted to stay in Beverly, but unfortunately, Comcast would not provide uh, broadband to the building we were in. So we looked around, we ended up in Peabody, and uh, we stayed in Peabody for a number of years. And, and you also were on the board of BevCam. Yes, but not until much later. I mean, my clients provided some great experiences because of the uh, exigencies with the oil markets. Efficiency was the byword. And European equipment manufacturers were producing much more efficient heating equipment than available in the States at that time. We represented uh, Riello, a prominent Italian heating manufacturer, uh, a few companies out of England, hmm. and we represented a lot of heating oil marketers. Did you do and, any international travel? Yeah, and we went to the trade shows in Milan every, uh, I think, three years, uh, which gave us a chance to tour Italy. And the best meal, one of the best, I would say the best meal we ever had in Italy was at the uh, Riello Executive Cafeteria near Verona. Hmm. We were ta invited there for lunch, and that was, that was great. And to show you the difference between manufacturing here and overseas. Here we are at the Riello factory, and these are all skilled mach uh, machinists, tool and die makers, We're working on very precise equipment and instrumentation. And they could freely drink wine and beer at lunch, no problem, go back to work, stay mm -hmm. for dinner at the company cafeteria. Uh, you know, so, you know, we got a glimpse of what things were like 
other parts of the world. Also, you're into the arts a lot, don't, don't, you, don't you go to a lot of shows? Well, over the years, my wife and I struck a, a deal, if you will. <laughs> I was a big fan of hockey at Boston University. Okay. And I knew the coach, uh, Jackie Parker. And um, the arrangement was she would join me for hockey games as long as I agreed to go to the theater. So over the years, we saw a number of stage plays. I remember a brilliant play coming to the Colonial Theater. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it originated, it started in Boston. That was Amadeus. Mm. And that was, a, that was a great production. We've seen some others. The best show I ever saw was at Ford's Theater in Washington where Lincoln was assassinated. Right. Hal Halbrook sat in a chair like this for two hours. Hal Holbrook. Hal Holbrook. Right. And you could have heard a pin drop. It was mesmerizing. Unbelievable. Well, I'm so glad anyway, you enjoyed it. We've got it. about three minutes left. Uh, what, Time what, flies, huh? When else would you like to get in? Three minutes now. <laughs> Well, no, I, I I did serve time in the Bebkin board, and I encouraged some innovation and uh, some creativity around here. Uh, I'm not sure it all took hold, <laughs> if any of it did. Um, and uh, I did enjoy, and I learned a lot, editing former Mayor Scanlon's book, which I would highly recommend to anybody. Uh, it's a great read. And it's not a long read, no, it, it, but it's you, very informative. You two did a, did a great job on that. I interviewed him uh, as part of his, the book coming out. And, uh, yeah, no. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of new people that have come to Beverly. They have no idea how bad shape Beverly was in. We moved, we, we were moving up here from Lynn. And when that was 94, and I thought Beverly was in fantastic shape <laughs> compared to Lynn. And uh, that may have been true, but I didn't know how tough a situation Beverly faced until, you know, maybe a year later. And, and I got to know uh, Bill Scanlon and uh, recognized all the problems the city had. Uh, I remember that there were, there were people who were squatters at what was then, uh, it wasn't coming center, the old shoe building, there were squatters because Black and Decker, which still held title to the property, was paying for heat light and people could squat, you know, and, and take advantage of the space if they were like freelancers or something. And um, yeah, that was great. That book recommended anybody, it's $15 through the Beverly Historic Society. Yeah, and you can get in paperback or? Right, 15 for the paperback. Right. If you buy a hardcover, Bill Scanlon would probably uh, autograph it for you. Uh, that said, uh, you know, personal well, activities keep me busy. Thanks for stopping by, and uh, your life story is very interesting. And uh, what's, your, what's your next project? You're always working <laughs> on a project. Uh, I really don't have anything you know, scheduled right now that's uh, prominent, but It'll come I, up. I do appreciate the fact you invited me for the interview. I have no idea why. <laughs> why? Because, there are other candidates. Because you're a productive, uh, interesting character in Beverly. Well, I thank you for that. And program deals with seniors and there are a number of seniors in Beverly including yourself that are still very productive so being a senior doesn't mean sitting in a rocking chair and watching television for the rest of your life there's no, plenty that, of things to get, in, too. to get involved with and you are a perfect example of giving back to the community in a number of ways well, thanks, Bob. That's why. You can still look up uh, some of the, my prior shows 
on the spot and local looks and things I did while I was here, involved with BevCam that uh, we went around and did a Mike Wallace type interview with a lot of the shopkeepers downtown. Right, great. Thanks again for watching uh, Senior Moments and happy holidays again to everybody. Bob Butterworth signing off for Senior Moments. Ooh, ooh, the New Year's Eve, we did the town. The day we tore the goalposts down, we will have these moments too.